This video is supported by EmuDB, the lightweight, high-speed immutable database for systems and applications. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. Today I start a very short mini-series of maybe two or three videos where I talk about the devices, the peripherals that go into the IBM line of mainframes, the S360, S370, ESA and Descendants. And in particular, we go into the history of some of those devices that we see, such as disk devices, uh, tape and uh, unit recording devices, such as uh, screens, punch card readers, etc. And try to understand what is the history and how do we get to where we are today. And the reason for this video is that when we look at, yeah, I'm connected here to an MVS 3.8 system, whenever we have to deal with disks, we need to know a little bit more about disks that you would have to know if you were running Windows or Linux or any such operating system. In Windows or Linux, a disk is totally abstracted and the geometry of the disk, uh, the sizes of the cylinders and the size of the tracks and the sectors, all that doesn't really matter because it's completely abstracted to the user and to the programming interface. However, uh, on the mainframe, since, uh, since the disk devices and other devices are record oriented where the operating system needs to know what is the format of the data record that you're going to write or read from from those devices we need to understand a lot more about the history of those devices and what they're capable of doing so that we can be more efficient when we write jcl job control language or when we need to debug something or we want to write new software Another reason I'm making this video is that recently you may know that uh, this amazing developer Bob Polmonter has created a network job entry subsystem for MBS. I've already made a couple of videos about that. And this uh, subsystem is able to receive messages over the mainframe network, which we call HNET, and store them on a spool uh, system, on a spool. Uh, buffer on disk and so understanding what is the format of those files that come in is important so just to show you very briefly what this is capable of doing and why uh, devices are important for this so uh, he wrote the system whereas I can from TSO send a command to let's say my uh, mainframe in uh, in a data center in Europe and say show me all the logged in users and they will now go and connect over network job entry, which is a mainframe protocol, which also exists for many other operating systems, such as Linux, uh, VMS, it existed for Windows, Cisco routers knew it, and then it goes there and gets me the results. So you can see here now, this is this machine here, uh, answering me what uh, systems are running right now. So, and the other thing is that two other amazing developers, Mike Grossman and, uh, Peter Jacob, uh, Jacob in uh, Germany, they wrote an, a viewer, kind of a spool viewer for the files that you're being sent over this uh, network, NG network, which we call HNET for, well, for, you can imagine what H stands for. And, uh, and so if you want to look at it, uh, you can look at it and you can see here that uh, the details of this file are important. What is the record format? Uh, what is the organization and in my previous video i showed why the dd statement in jcl is very important because you need to specify all the characteristics of any data set or file in mvs or zos or any other descendant and so uh, understanding also not only what the organization of the data sets is but also what kind of devices it sits on and certain limitations of certain devices you cannot code any kind of it's it, you cannot just code any kind of uh, characteristics for any device you need to be aware of the disk devices that data sets are being stored on to write them or to read them uh, properly so that's why i thought we'll make a video once and for all and and show the whole history of data sets on uh, the mainframe on the IBM mainframe, where we came from and how did we get today. Today we're only going to look at the DASD, the Disk Direct Access uh, Storage Device, and um, 
and all disk devices and disk-like devices. Some were not disk, but they behave like disks. And then we're gonna have uh, one or two more videos where we look at tape devices, and then maybe we combine unit and special into a third video. So maybe with three videos, we can get along. Uh, this is an advertising from Computer World, I think uh, November 1981. As you can see here, they were selling uh, uh, used discs. Now you would think that in today's world, why would anybody buy a used uh, disc? Because the discs, they get used and they break down. Well, not so with IBM because they were excellently serviced and, and maintained by IBM. There was always somebody on site and if it would break, IBM would come and fix it within hours. So it would make, very often it would make sense to buy uh, used storage devices, used disk devices. And we'll see about the size and characteristics of all of those in a second. But uh, so this is very typical that people would buy 3350s, 3370s, 75s, 80s. And what is the meaning of all that? And, and to some extent, I see in the community, people just take it for granted that they just got better and better and faster and faster. Well, that's not the whole story. There's a story to tell about disk devices for the IBM mainframe. And I'm gonna tell you the story today. All right, so the direct attached storage device, the history is that it started in 1956. So IBM invented, by the way, the, the disk, the, uh, uh, the spinning disk and it was invented in 1956 and uh, they called it the RAMAC. I don't remember exactly what, what RAMAC stands for but it's a well-known name and in fact for years people used to call discs RAMAX. So it was the first commercial computer so it was a computer with a disc inside. So the RAMAC 305 RAMAC was both a mainframe and the disc came together. And here RAMAC stands actually random access method of accounting and control. As you can see, accounting was at the time the IBM 305 and the 605 and the 705 mainframes, uh, the 650 mainframes, they were all still mainly geared at uh, accounting. So processing records. And that's why we still have a, a record, uh, um, I want to say history and tradition on the mainframe today, because these all started with processing accounting records or um, kind of records that are repetitive, such as census records, etc. Um, they also invented uh, in the 50s something called drum memory, which was widely used uh, also into the 60s. It's kind of a computer memory uh, and not a disk device. So it was a spinning disk device, but it was used actually of, as computer memory. So something that was stored there, the computer would be able to read it again. Uh, if he needed, uh, so was treating it kind of a, as a RAM, but of course it was it was a mechanical device, an ele electron mechanical device. It was very very slow, but of course still much faster than than having to go to tape or punch cards. And so for a while, drum uh, drums were widely used because they would extend the memory of the mainframe, but they were not used as disk devices to store or read uh, data sets from. Now we're going to go, before we go into the disks themselves, the devices, we need to understand that on the mainframe there's two architectures for storing, uh, for, for storing data on disks. One is called uh, CKD, which is count, key, um, and data area. And that is the prevalent way to store and read disks on uh, data on disks. And it's really, you think you should think of it more of like of a formatting thing. So there are disks that could only be formatted this way. Some other disks could only be formatted this way, which is for fixed block architecture. So they had the fixed uh, addressable block. And the CKD can only be used on ZOS. Uh, that's the only disk uh, device that it can be used on ZOS and MVS kind of operating systems. Whereas VM, uh, ZVM and Descendants, and DOS VS and VSC are able to use also fixed block uh, disks. They were cheaper. Think of them almost like ice, uh, like SCSI disks, and this would be specialty disk. So in a CKD device, each data record on the disk controls uh, the, the record and the number of bytes that are gonna be stored in that record. And optionally also a key area where you can store a key um, if you wanna use this for fast access. The, the CKD device uh, uh, for the count key uh, data organization comes from the from the architecture of the mainframe, 
where each I.O. operation is being offloaded to an I.O. processor through the channel command word, uh, which is an I.O. command. And so anytime the mainframe needs to do I.O., it will set, set up a channel command word in real memory and then send it off to the controller of those devices. And, and uh, the CKD architecture maps particularly well into the in this kind of architecture. So that's why CKD goes hand in hand with the uh, MVS and ZOS operating systems. Later operating systems, um, well, DOS has actually predated uh, OS 360 by, quite, by one or two years, but other operating systems adopted cheaper disk devices. And so the emphasis here, it was on getting cheaper devices uh, that will be cost, that cost maybe a fourth or fifth of a CKD device. And uh, so they had to change those operating systems to be able to use fixed block architecture where every block is the exact same size. And, um, and so they made those changes to VM and to VSE, but they didn't do it for uh, MVS and ZOS. So we will, I, we will be mostly be concerned that whenever you speak mainframe, you're mostly talking about CKD devices, but um, in other areas, you still uh, often encounter FBA devices. I myself, for my mainframe, use an FBA disk device, and Linux, of course, runs very nicely with uh, FBA devices or SCSI devices. So um, that's the, that's my primary use for my mainframe that I've acquired a while ago is to use uh, Linux on it. So before we go into more specifics of the of the disks, one more thing: we you will always see tracks and cylinders being mentioned whenever you talk mainframe. So every disk device has several platters. Each one of those is a platter. It could be up to 20 for some uh, disk models. This will be an actuator, which means like behind here is an actuator, which actually moves the read heads. And you can see here the read head. Uh, it moves it in and out to find data on the spinning disks. So these are access arms, and there will be five or seven, sometimes 11 access arms. Usually the top platter or the bottom platter would not be storing data. They would be used for calibration purposes. And then you have track. Um, as you can see here, a track is full circle around the disk platter. And obviously there's more data on a track here than there would be here because it's a, it's a, smaller, it's a smaller circle, circumference. And, um, and then um, a cylinder would be a collection of tracks on all the platters that are addressable that would make a cylinder. So you have a track, which is one circle. On every platter, there's a number of tracks. Let's say in this one, there will be 202 tracks. And then each vertical track is assembled into a number. They all together make up a cylinder. So it's important to understand that if, if you need to stop and uh, listen to this again and go back, that's fine. I'm going to be right here waiting for you. So tracks are the circular uh, tracks on the disk and the cylinder will be a collection of those tracks. Now, drum memory, as I mentioned before, a very special device, um, highly timing sensitive. It was used by the IBM 650 accounting mainframe and it was used as RAM. Uh, there was one, there was model one with 8.5 kilobytes, and then they made another one with 17 kilobytes. Um, by the way, uh, IBM was not the only one using drum memory. The, the DEC mini computer 1145 used drums uh, for swapping, so not as a memory extension, but they were using it for uh, for paging for virtual memory, and they were being sold until uh, 1989. So uh, some people think drums are a thing of the 40s and 50s, uh, 1940s, 1950s, but no, they were used until very late in the 80s. And in fact, I did see once a device from the outside that was a drum paging uh, swapping device for a PDP. And in this photograph from 1956 or maybe 57, you see a, an IBM 305 Ramac uh, hard disk being uh, loaded into an airplane, into a cargo for delivery. They were quite uh, popular in the late 50s, uh, especially in Europe and in France. I think France was one of the top uh, countries for purchases of this computer. It weighed one metric ton. It had a capacity of 4.4 megabytes and used vacuum tubes for electronics. So now let's get to uh, the the DASTIs that were announced as part of the IBM S360 product family 
1965 when IBM announced the processor, the S360, with the architecture. Obviously, they uh, to be modern in those days, you needed to have a disk device to announce the computer with a disk device. So what they did is they simply took the a disk that came with the previous mainframe, the very uh, popular IBM uh, 1301 uh, uh, mainframe. It was a small decimal arithmetic uh, uh, mainframe for, for business purposes. And they took that disk, the 1302, and turned it into 230T. Uh, it had, the only difference was that it had uh, CKD formatting and they required the 2841 storage unit that understood all that stuff and would allow uh, DOS VS at the time to work with this disk device. So 2302T, 2302 is already a disk that people may remember. It was before my time, I don't remember it. And then shortly after uh, they announced, uh, actually five, six years later, they announced a 2305. Uh, this was a special disk that was only used for swapping uh, because it had very fast I.O. It had three megabytes per second uh, capacity uh, processing I.O. And so was used, uh, this disk, which was kind of an adaptation of this device, but changed uh, especially on the I.O. channel side and the dressing side to be able to use, to be used as a swapping device for this kind of lines of mainframe. So S370-155, uh, the 165 to 158, and the 168, uh, this were announced without uh, dynamic address uh, translation in the beginning. And then the famous 3033, which is kind of a, uh, some people say no more, no less than an S370-168. And then the 4341s, which were smaller, uh, kind of IBM mini mainframes, mini computers for VM use and for VSE use. And the 3081, on which I actually happened to work in the early 80s or mid 80s. So those could use this device as a swapping device so that they could have more users or more throughput by uh, cramming more stuff into the limited memory. So then came the 2311. The 2311 is actually a disk that we also have in MVS uh, TK4, especially the, uh, the follow-on unit 2314. It was announced in 1964 with the S360 architecture, so at the same time and required a 2841 DASTI controller. And remember that on the mainframe, the, the, the processor does never, never talks to the, to the devices. The I.O. processors or the channels talk to devices, but the channels only talk to devices through device controllers. And that the device controllers are actually the ones that really electrically and logically talk to the devices. So you have the CPU, the channel, the controller and then the device. And so this required the 2841 DASD controller to be attached to the channels, to the block channels. It could do, uh, it had a uh, capacity per, these were uh, interchangeable disk packs. You could take them out as was the fashion back then in the 60s. So you could have, they would tell you, you could have unlimited uh, storage because you could just, when you were running out, you could put a new platter in but it's not exactly the same if for accessing another data set, you will have to change the platter. But anyway, um, it had seven and a quarter megabytes, that's megabytes of storage on the whole platter here, on the whole disk pack, um, which is six platters, okay, plus one control platter. It had 200 tracks and 10 read write heads, probably for, you know, one above, one below each and 85 milli millisecond seek time on average. So this was the average. If you were all the way here on the platter and need to move all the way here, it would be probably 150 milliseconds, but 160, 170. But if you were, or you know, on average, if you had four accesses in a random access pattern, it would equate to about 85 milliseconds. The transfer rate today looks ridiculous, 158 kilobytes per second. Think of like almost like a modern uh, kind of a, or the, for the very early uh, home um, cable modems were about this speed. So that's the speed that the processor would see the data coming in when reading uh, or writing. So very early. Then came the 2314, which they called pizza oven because they had, a, this was all one disk device and it had, um, it had uh, 11 uh, 
drawers that you could pull out and where you could put platters and one was spare so sorry nine drives of uh, and plus one spare so you would have this platters where you could uh, remove the whole disc pack it was announced in 1965 required the 2314 dusty controller which yeah had this it's the same name it's not a mistake for a big, why is that because the controller and the disc were one and the same thing it was one huge unit these are not separate units this is one huge unit uh, again 200 tracks with 20 read write heads again 85 milliseconds uh, seek time on average and so and at the same 150i 58 kilobytes transfer rate which was in later models then increased to 310 this kind of shows you that this is a kind of a uh, this comes on the architecture of the 23A11 they built 2314. This was a CKD device, so we use it on MBS 3.8 TK4 that we use today every day and love. This is for the sort volumes, and why is that important? Because the sort program that we have available in the public domain with MBS TK4 uh, is built with the geometry and with the and with the capability of this disk device in mind. It cannot work with any other disk device. So the sort that we have, unfortunately, we need to first move the data sets to a 2314 and needs to be blocked correctly for 2314. So the sort can then uh, do its job and sort those data sets or merge or whatever we need to do. But uh, this is, and that's why we have this disk devices present in uh, stock MBS 3 day TK4 update eight or whenever update nine, nine comes out. Now somebody's working on a new sort program that uh, supposedly is compatible with the old sort from IBM. Uh, probably not with the new sort uh, from IBM. But on the mainframe, sorting is a very, very important job step that when you do batch sorting is or merging is always there somewhere. So, uh, and uh, we right now are limited to this kind of devices. Right after that, the IBM 3330 came out it was announced in 1970. There were two models, one with 100 megabytes per pack and the model 11 at 200. Essentially, the packs were the same, just the electronics were fine-tuned a little bit more and refined so that they could just double the amount of data stored per pack. Uh, that uh, significantly improved seek time of 30 milliseconds and transfer rate vastly improved to 806 kilobytes per second, which started to be something that uh, people could now uh, uh, work for and especially um, because it had a such improved seek time people love to use them for just two spool data sets where there's a lot of random read write and so that's why on that MBS TK4 we use 3330 devices for the JES spool so that when you produce output or when you get input it goes through the spool devices uh, on 3330s error correction was included for the first time and that made the DASTY become very reliable. So it was the, this was before then, DASTYs were just to speed up things. People would use still tape for reliability and for keeping the master copy of a data set. It was starting with the 3330 that people started to trust and data center, data centers trust, started to trust disk devices more so that actually they would keep the copies of the master files on disk and not on tape anymore. Uh, a little bit later, the 3310 was announced, and you would think, why is the 3330 announced before the 3310? Well, the numbering doesn't have to make sense. You just have to know that. So it was announced in 1979, so quite a bit later. This had a 70 megabytes uh, uh, capacity, and it was built specifically for the 4331 mainframe, which, as I said, mentioned, as I mentioned before, is a primarily VM and DOS VS. Uh, oriented mainframe. Later, much later versions were able to run MBS as well, the 4381 T92 for instance. But the early and the early versions were only able to run these operating systems because of the of the page key sizes and many other things that they didn't do which MBS needs. So um, so um, this and this is a fixed block disk so similar to SCSI devices. And that's why to this day VM and DOS VS support FBA disks, which I use for my frame frame um, that I acquired recently. Then the 3340 came out, which had a removable pack which you put in, but the pack itself was uh, was sealed and had the head assembly inside. 
So before the head assembly would move in from the outside, from the disc device in between the platters on the disc pack and would, and, and in fact, before you could out, take out the disc platter, you have to make sure that the, uh, the head assemblies were retracted. Here in this case, the head assembly was part of the disc, uh, disc pack. And so it was air locked and that's why IBM called it the Winchester. And in fact, for, I remember until the mid 80s maybe or late 80s, some people called hard disk even on the PC Winchester. And if I'm not mistaken, the very first hard disk announced for the IBM uh, PC XT was still called the Winchester Drive. So it was common for me to say Winchester Drive when I was a kid. And those packs had either 35 megabytes or 70 megabytes, uh, depending on the model. And the sick time was the famous 25 milliseconds. I once I uh, was on the board of a company called 25 milliseconds because this kind of sick time stayed for a long time and especially um, low-end computers and personal computers when they started to have disks those were um, the access times sick times were 25 milliseconds for a long time even on servers so uh, that's why that company that I was on the board of uh, was called 25 milliseconds well obviously a technology company and then the transfer rate uh, was still around 810 kilobytes per second. And this is the device we use on our MVSTK4 for the paging volumes. Uh, and uh, because the formatting makes a lot of sense to put it on those devices. Then came the 3350. The 3350 actually stayed on for a long, long time. And uh, it's a device that actually made kind of the reliability was uh, was really well known. And some of these devices worked for 20 years. Uh, so it was announced in 1975. It was a fixed uh, device, no, no movable packs, which of course increased reliability because think about those packs, you know, any grain of dirt would, um, would potentially be a head crash. And so instead of going for what they called back then unlimited uh, storage through removable packs, IBM focused here on speed and reliability. And so, um, and after, in fact, after this was, you know, from the moment, moment they released the 3350, IBM never again released removable disk pack DASDs uh, in the future again. This was the one before. The 3340 was the last one with it, which had re removable packs. Um, but the success of the fixed pack was kind of uh, decided IBM that this was going to be the future. So they were used for, as I said, a long time. In fact, uh, I saw some uh, in the mid 80s for sure. And some were used as late as 1995 in certain data centers. The capacity of this drive is 317 megabytes. Uh, I know those, these are now numbers that I start to know very well by heart, 555, 555 cylinders, 30 heads, 19 kilobytes per track, and still the 25 millisecond SIG time. Transfer was now 1.2 megabytes per second. And if you look at where we were just a few years before, at 806 kilobytes, we had actually made now quite nice progress with 1.2 megabytes per second. So this is the, on MVSTK4, this is the volume and that's the we use for the IPL, or as some people call it, as the booting of the operating system. So the operating system on MVSTK4 resides on one of those devices. Then IBM released the 3370 and 3375, which we are also using on TK4. And uh, it was kind of a smaller, uh, cabinet version so better electronics uh, there was a version which had FBA so fixed block architecture and the 30, 375 for the count key data uh, version and the capacity was increased to 571 megabytes and the sick time actually significantly I want to say here uh, improved again and transfer rate sorry for the speller here 1.9 megabytes per second so we use this for the public volumes on TK4 pub 00 pub 001 those are the public volumes that use this kind of device and those also stayed on for a long long time then finally the 
iconic IBM 3380 disk devices were announced, which you see here in the picture. They were tall cabinets. A human would maybe, well, I could maybe get all the way here, I think. Uh, this is maybe six and a half feet or something like that. Um, so they were made for a long time. They were announced in 1980, and I think the last one was uh, released in 1989. So I saw plenty of those, many, many of those. And um, they started with the A, B, D, E, and K models, and each model had slightly improved uh, capacity. So they started with 2.5 gigabytes in 1980 through five gigabytes, which is the ones I worked in most. And then we had E and K, which were 7.5 gigabytes, and they were actually released in 1987, withdrawn, I think, in 1990. Sig times uh, was 60 milliseconds, transfer rate three megabytes per second. So once this, this device here was announced, most data centers, I want to say 80%, removed all the previous kind of DASDs and focused on this exclusively. They were fast, they, uh, they had a lot of capacity at the time. I worked in a place in the mid 80s where the whole, there was one big uh, database, a transactional database with uh, millions of records. And the whole database was five gigabytes. So there were two disk drives. So, um, and uh, so they were very, very popular, very reliable. And the uh, transfer rate was now three megabytes per second. So you could have, you know, you could now start to put paging and a spool space and the um, the IBM uh, Nucleus, the MBS Nucleus, all in one device if you wanted to, and it was fast enough to do all that. Then, um, 1989, IBM announced the 3390. Now, the 3390 is the, for a lot of people, it's the only DASTY that they will know. I mean, a lot of people, when they think of DASTY for MBS and ZOS, they think 3390 because that's all there is today. IBM, this was the last um, CKD device IBM ever made. Um, and everything after that became a SAN or a NAS offering that could emulate the CKD formatting. But uh, this device was announced in 89. It existed in, in model one, three, and nine. So 1.9 gigabytes, three or 9.4 gigabytes, sick time, nine milliseconds, 12 megabytes per second. Uh, transfer rate, which of course uh, with SAN is, is is vastly higher than this. I mean, on a on a on a modern IBM SAN, the transfer rate would be a m many multiples of that. But we even on MBS 3.8, we use the 3390. Now, some people say, how is it possible for an operating system which was released in 1980 or 81, such as MBS 3.8, to have support for a disk device that came much later? Was it compatible? No, it's not compatible. But some people sat down and actually wrote drivers for this disk. And that's why we can actually address the 3390 disk on MBS 3.8. There's also some people out there they said that say that, I just got an um, email like this last week saying that, oh, uh, you should know that MBS 3.8 is a 16-bit operating system. So therefore, uh, you can only address 65 kilo, 65 uh, things on a, on a platter. And <laughs> I don't know where, first of all, MBS already is 24-bit. And what you're addressing are the control intervals on, let's say, on BSAM. And so you can access with 24, with 24 bit, you can access 16 million control intervals times the control interval size. So you could address much, much larger volumes than just what people think with 24 bit, even when they erroneously say 16 bit. So uh, we can absolutely work with those. And more significantly, any operating system from MBS ESA on, uh, through OS 390, through ZOS, to this day supports 3390 disks almost exclusively only. So um, it's a it's a very important disk because it exists in emulated way. Even on real mainframes today, this disk is emulated. It doesn't exist anymore uh, in physical. Nobody makes 3390 spinning disks anymore. Uh, there's EMC and Itachi and IBM and many others. They make uh, storage arrays that can emulate this uh, formatting and the protocol of the 3390. So today we come now to the present year time and you have a SAN device that looks like this. 
just like a you know like a rack mountable unit this could be also would look like a server and in fact very often those are running Linux inside as the operating system and then you put in the platters that you need the disk devices that you need and it emulates CKD and FBA disks um, and these are some of the people who make those disk devices so let's talk about the geometries again just to see what we've done here we started with the 2311 and these are the track sizes the sick time and the capacity so maybe we focus only on capacity sick time and the type so we start with 85 milliseconds 7 megabyte capacity and then within the span of 20 years we went from 7 megabytes we went to 9 gigabytes and the sick time went from 85 down to 9 milliseconds and uh, and that's significant because I want to say that virtual memory without fast disks wouldn't make sense so we would probably not have virtual memory if this hadn't improved substantially I want to say that um, we would not see disks as the primary holder for data and operating systems we probably still you see tape as those primary holders for uh, production data sets and many other innovations that came along such as for instance also time sharing interactive computing those things were only possible because disk devices came along they were fast enough had enough capacity and were reliable enough to for people to use I mean, imagine we would have a time sharing system where uh, every time you need to access something it needs to be on tape that wouldn't work or a punch card it needs to be on something that is that has random access that is fast and obviously that's reliable because if you offer an unreliable service to users they will they will not stick along very for for a lot of time so those are the geometries and here we have again the correct geometry for each of all these devices so if you need to freeze here so you can see it uh, oops so here it is again in all its glory so this is not a table that's easy to find out on the internet um, in fact if I had to assemble one I have I have a program that is on my github repository that calculates the ideal block size for a given uh, fix um, uh, for a uh, fixed block length for any kind of those devices so I have this table in a program but if you need to have this table uh, written down somewhere then here's the table so you can see here the the tracks per cylinder bytes per track which is the key measure here it's all here now how does disk access work so people are sometimes surprised to, to hear that MVS and follow-on operating systems such as OS 3.9 and ZOS don't have a file system in the classic sense of the word uh, on MVS and uh, sorry on Linux and Windows when we when we want to allocate a, a file uh, there's only one thing we need to there's only two things we need to worry about which is the name of the file and in which directory it's going to be we don't have to worry if there's enough space we don't have to worry uh, to grow the file as we keep adding we just assume the operating system if there is enough space on the disk it's just going to give me more and more space until I run out of disk space I don't need to worry about record format I don't need to worry on which disk it is this is all automated on MVS, OS 3.9, ZOS, and uh, and some of the other operating systems on the mainframe, you do need to think about all those things. So uh, there is on every volume. So first of all, let's start on every mainframe. Every instance of a mainframe has a master catalog. That's a catalog that the nucleus, the operating system, loads when he when it starts and the user usually caches it which has information about all the data sets it knows and all the volumes it knows and if any data set has been registered in the volume with the master catalog or any other sub catalog then it will be able to find like this so you request the data set it goes through the catalog program it asks the catalog the catalog then goes and checks the volumes where it, it has a link to the volumes that contain those data sets and then the volume will have a way to find the data set on its volume on that disk and how does that work through the so on every disk here in every volume there's something called the VTOC the virtual table of contents 
or volume table, sorry, volume table of contents, which is a vSAM data set at, at, on every disk. You can decide where you want to put it on the disk for performance reasons. And it will have an index to every data set that exists on that volume. Now, what's important to understand is you can put the data set on a volume and not register with any catalog, which means that to find it again, you would have to go know exactly on which volume it is. So, and as a consequence, you could have two data sets called moshix.youtube exist on five different volumes, and that's perfectly fine. And, uh, and you, need, you would need to know which one you want to work in based on the volume. You can only have one data set with, one, with, with a unique name per volume, but throughout the mainframe, you could have many data sets with the same with the same uh, name. Now, once you register with a catalog, either the master catalog or a sub catalog of what's called the user catalog, then you need to start to pay attention not to have duplicate names or it will complain. Dataset names as a first part, let's take a good example, moshix.youtube.examples.pli source. So people uh, sometimes ask me, what is the maximum length of a dataset name on MBS or ZOS? The standard is it can only be 44 length, 44 characters long, including the dots. Okay, so uh, each one counts as well. So the dots count because we don't really have subdirectories. So those are really part of the name. Now, we also have something called the high level qualifier. When we, when we call something like this, moshix.youtube, then I can, if I search for moshix, then it will tell me all the other data sets that exist with starting with the Moshix. So that will be the first high level qualifier. And then I can have Moshix.youtube.examples or Moshix.youtube.production. And they, will, they would share the same two high level qualifiers and then the third high level qualifier will be, will be different and so on. So you can have as many high level qualifiers as you want as long as it all fits within 44 characters. And it is this high level qualifier that kind of sometimes gives us the impression that we're running on a on a hierarchical file system, but we're not. There's no hierarchy, they're all exactly the same. Whether you have two, you know, two third level, high level qualifiers under the second and first, or only one, they're all exactly the same. It's just a human perception of a, of a directory, but there's no directories in MBS or ZOS. Uh, the high level qualifier also usually is, is the username for TSO and the reason or for the job uh, submission um, name and that's because in TSO the username is usually uh, put in at the beginning of every data set that you describe unless you put it within quotes. If you put it within quotes it's going to be taken literally. If you don't put quotes you can just put in YouTube examples of please source and then TSO will automatically add your username Moshix if your username was Moshix. And that's it. So we explained the disks that have existed since the beginning of the S360 line and even a little bit before what they're capable of and in the next video we'll look at tape and how tapes have evolved even more dramatically, I want to say, than disk devices. If you have any questions about the disks and how they work and what they're good for and all the geometries and all that kind of stuff, then please uh, do drop me a line or join our Discord channel. I will put in the address under in the description below this video. And uh, if at any time you want to post a comment or post a question, plenty of people will answer here. So thank you very much for watching and please don't forget to press on the thumbs up button and to subscribe.